Uh, today we're going to do a, a global view of hearing loss and cochlear implantation. I know we have a mixed group. We have some pediatricians, we have some audiologists, and, and uh, some otolaryngologists. So hopefully this will uh, address um, or, or give you something to ponder and digest as you um, manage the patients that come your way. And, and then maybe we can have some discussion at the end, either formally or, or after the fact. I'll be happy to stick around if, if anybody has any more specific questions that uh, the talk brings to your mind. But uh, with that, we'll get going. I hope that I know how to use this. I'm supposed to disclose to y'all that I have financial interests that really aren't very much, but I speak occasionally for um, Alcon and Lupin, which are Cipridex and Suprax and Advanced Bionics and Cochlear are uh, uh, sponsoring today's event for you, so appreciate them doing that. So, you may or may not realize it, but hearing loss is the most prevalent developmental abnormality that uh, uh, exists at birth. And so with that comes a lot of responsibility on our part in the medical field to uh, try to identify that and then intervene on these uh, children's behalf. The incidence is about 4,000 deaf children per year with about 37,000 born with milder forms of hearing loss. Um, about one in six, one to six of every thousand children are born with hearing loss and about four to 11 of every 10,000 are deaf. So what should we do after they're born? Well, finally in 2008, Tennessee adopted um, a universal hearing screening protocol. It's been being pushed uh, since 93, 94, um, but uh, we uh, had something called Claire's Law that was adopted in, on July 1st of 2008. She was a girl in Nashville who has hearing loss and ultimately got a cochlear implant, and um, she was sort of uh, one of the people that was uh, used legislatively to help push this and, and thankfully our legislators in the state uh, have made that a requirement for all children that are born. So how successful are we being? Well, about 95 percent of children are now being effectively screened for hearing loss. So that's the first step in our process of trying to um, intervene on behalf of these children. The problem that we have now is that our follow-up for newborn hearing screening falls short. And so about 28% of children that have hearing loss are not getting documented follow-up and subsequently because of that not getting effective intervention. So follow-up is really one of the key hurdles that we face in um, pediatric medicine for making sure that children who have hearing loss are identified and then making sure once they're identified that they seek and obtain appropriate intervention and treatment. We shouldn't forget those children that lose hearing after they're born as well that have acquired hearing loss or progressive hearing loss. So for every 10 children that are identified with hearing loss at birth, another five to nine children will manifest hearing loss by nine years of age. And, it's, and evidence would suggest that nine-year-olds with significant hearing loss in the ac academic environment, about 50% of those will have passed their newborn hearing screening earlier on. So one of the things that we do when we're working up patients is we'll you know, take a perinatal history of what happened um, during uh, pregnancy and, and in the um, perinatal period. And one of those things is to make sure they got a newborn hearing screen and then try to get it. You know, and you've got just a few years to get that because most hospitals will keep their records for five to seven years. So once you identify a child with hearing loss, if you can grab that newborn hearing screen, you know, from the hospital they were born at where you can see pass, pass in both ears or refer, refer in both ears or what have you, then that gives you something to put on their chart and, and lets you know whether you're dealing with an acquired hearing loss or whether you're dealing with a congenital hearing loss. Clearly, American Academy of Pediatrics and the Joint Committee on he Infant Hearing have encouraged um, screening throughout the early years for children, so not just at childbirth, um, during infancy, during early childhood, and uh, into middle childhood and adolescence. And hearing screening is suggested to be performed at well child visits at 4, 5, 6, 8, and 10. Um, so most pediatrics offices are pretty good about doing that. And hopefully we have that set up in such a way that we have a few too many false positives as opposed to false negatives so that that screening um, modality will be effective and those children that have hearing loss can be referred. And then hopefully some of those will end up not having hearing loss, but we'll capture those, uh, most all of those that do. 
So just to reiterate, when we have a well child visit with hearing rechecks and referrals, unfortunately about half of the 10% of children who fail those are not getting um, followed up or referred to be able to address that. And so uh, it's our burden as practitioners to try to close that gap and make sure those children aren't um, overlooked or fall through the cracks. So what should we do as practitioners? Well, we need to use your newborn hearing screening. We need to use these well child checks and we need to make sure follow up occurs. We need an all of above approach. We need to try to capture these children at whatever age it is that they start developing hearing loss. And how can we make that happen as practitioners? Well, it's gonna take cooperation. It's a multidisciplinary process. We need hospitals and birthing centers um, doing the newborn hearing screening and making sure that that happens when the screening machine goes down, making sure it gets repaired and you don't have two months of children going through a hospital that don't get tested. Um, we need to have neonatologists and perinatologists who um, are in tune with what we're doing from a hearing loss perspective, and most of them are um, pediatricians and family practitioners understanding that at well child visits these hearing screenings are vitally important, and um, then pediatric audiologists and otolaryngologists providing um, follow-up and intervention, making sure we get correct diagnoses and then offer the appropriate uh, intervention from a uh, habilitation or rehabilitation standpoint for these children. The uh, Early Hearing Detection Institute suggests that by one month of age all newborns should be screened. By three months of age if they've had a confirmed hearing loss that they um, get a uh, referral and then by six months that they enroll in early intervention services. So it's a one three, six approach that they're trying to really impress upon those of us in clinical medicine to follow and make sure that happens. And as we all know, a lot of times these children kind of just mull along for months on end and, and end up finally by nine to 12 months making their way and getting their hearing aids. And we're trying to push that back because we know that these children um, past milestones of development from a communication standpoint that are very hard to make up for. So the sooner we can get a hearing aid or an implant on these children, um, if they've been identified with significant hearing loss, then the better off they'll do long term. So when we have a refer or fail on a newborn hearing screen, they need hearing testing follow-up every three months until they're three every six months until they're six and annually after they're six. And if they have progressive loss, we typically try to do hearing testing every three months. Um, so if they pass but have a high risk factor, then the first audiology evaluation should be between six and nine months of age. Usually should not require sedation to do that testing. If they're a higher risk factor, they need to be tested ongoing at once every six months. Lower risk factor just once every year until they're five years of age. These are the things we've got to avoid saying as practitioners to parents. I'm sure you can hear okay, most ba babies pass the rescreen. Um, it's always just fluid or vernix or wax in their ear come back and you know, follow up is often not great for these patients' families. Don't diminish a, a failed hearing screen. It's our burden to follow that up. So moving on to some uh, discussion of types of hearing loss. Historically, we've divided hearing loss into conductive and sensory neural loss, and we just kind of had this big wastebasket category of sensory neural, where um, conductive, everything is uh, lateral to the oval window, and sensory neural is everything medial to that. Um, more recently, though, with otoacoustic emission testing, we can actually divide sensory from neural, which is somewhat important when it comes to um, cochlear implantation um, because if you have an auditory neuropathy while some children have responded well with implantation and we've implanted some of those children we know that the sensory hearing loss children, the children who have cochlear dysfun dysfunction specifically um, can do very well. So uh, certainly diagnostic testing on the part of our audiology colleagues has improved, has allowed us to be more specific with parents about telling them where your child's hearing loss is emanating from and uh, then also offer some uh, opportunity for us to, to um, be more appropriate with what we recommend for intervention. The other thing is, is MRI is now 
um, one of the important imaging modalities for two reasons, especially with cochlear implantation, because you can determine if you have cochlear hypoplasia or aplasia. You don't have a hearing nerve, which would just which would, you know, obviously be a contraindication for cochlear implantation. If you don't have a nerve, you can't take the sound to the brain. Um, but also because these children, if they do ultimately get implanted, um, then it's very difficult to get an MRI after you've been implanted. You can do it, but it's a challenge, and so um, getting that MRI beforehand is important. How do we uh, categorize hearing loss? We categorize it by what we just talked about, conductive, sensory, neural, and then central hearing loss, or CAPD, central auditory processing disorders, or where um, they have problems processing auditory cues. Uh, the onset, is it congenital or is it acquired? Sidedness, is it unilateral, bilateral, symmetrical or asymmetrical? Severity, you see listed there, all the way to profound, and then character, stable, progressive, or fluctuant. About 50%, maybe even 60% of hearing loss is genetic, about 25% is acquired, and about 25% is other. Um, we probably will find that that 25% other will end up being genetic of some type in the future, but uh, that uh, is probably going to go hand in hand with the Human Genome Project, project and a lot of our um, basic science research uh, colleagues who uh, are continuing to identify various genes that specifically encode hearing loss. Of the genetic hearing loss, about 75% is autosomal recessive, about 10% uh, is autosomal dominant, and 15% are something else like X-linked recessive or other um, types of hearing loss there. Connexin 26, you may have heard this term, but let's talk about it just for just a second. It's responsible for a third of all genetic hearing loss. Uh, it's responsible for about half of all non-syndromic genetic hearing loss. And I was pleased to talk with Dr. Abkis earlier. He was out at Iowa where um, Dr. Smith and, and his group of researchers identified this gene originally. And so I think that um, in the otolaryngology world and the audiology world, these are, are genes that we're well familiar with and, and maybe some of you in pediatrics as well. But um, it, uh, it's good for us from a cochlear implant standpoint because children with connection 26 related hearing loss do very well with cochlear implantation if they have severe to profound loss. But this connection 26 is a protein found on the GJB2 gene and it's the most common cause of congenital sensory neural hearing loss. It um, usually is severe to profound, it's usually prelingual and it's usually non-progressive and these kids do very well with cochlear implantation. They typically don't have imaging abnormalities, they don't have anatomic or structural abnormalities, their vestibular function is usually very good. Um, and what these proteins do, what the connexin proteins do, they're gap junction proteins which are necessary for cells to communicate with each other and without sufficient levels of connexin 26, the potassium flow from hair cells in the cochlea gets disrupted and so your potassium levels increase intracellularly in the organ of cordy and lead to profound sensory hearing loss. So. Implications. So if you've got a patient whose child tests positive for connexin 26, what does that mean for the family? Well, it means if they have one deaf child that about 25% of their subsequent children have the chance of being deaf also. And about two-thirds of their children um, have a chance of carrying the mutation. So I just put the box down there. Y'all are probably familiar with Mendelian genetics, but um, if you look at the plus plus down at the right bottom, box, that's a child that's deaf. So if you have a child that's deaf and a subsequent child is not deaf, then you can see there are three boxes there, two of which are carriers for the connexin 26 gene. Does that make sense to everybody? So a one-third chance of the, the uh, other siblings not carrying the gene. But a lot of causes of sensory neural hearing loss, we've talked about congenital a bit and hereditary, but infectious, inflammatory, autoimmune, noise-induced, and ototoxic-related um, hearing loss are not um, as frequent, but uh, certainly things that we see from time to time and have to be considered. Uh, meningitis, fortunately, with Prevnar vaccine and decreased pneumococcal meningitis, um, uh, we've seen fewer and fewer episodes, but one of the things you have to consider with meningitis is you get what's called labyrinthitis ossificans, where the cochlea um, can ossify or turn into basically bone. You get this inflammatory reaction to meningitis and so 
in those situations, it's really important if you identify hearing loss that you uh, move quickly towards intervention rather than dragging your feet because you can um, prevent the effective implantation of those patients. Torch infections, our pediatric and neonatal colleagues are, are familiar with. We don't see them as frequently. Um, I've probably seen a little bit more urban areas uh, with, with um, syphilis, um, but uh, certainly there's things that we'll see from time to time. Um, Ototoxic medication and exposure for those children that get NEC at birth and have to be on IV antibiotics for a prolonged period of time. There actually is a group of children, um, and not just children, but people that are hypersensitive to aminoglycosides that actually got a genetic test out. You don't know if you're hypersensitive or not, but they're more sensitive to the effects of aminoglycosides, and um, that can be an issue for some. And then hyperbilirubinemia, obviously we're very aggressive with bilirubin levels in the postnatal period and so this is one of those reasons why because that's, that's something that we occasionally see and it's certainly a very preventable thing um, for these children, whether it's getting that child in the sunshine or whether it's actually doing phototherapy more formally right after birth, preventing that hyperbilirubinemia that can potentially cause hearing loss is extremely important. Reminder of neonatal hearing loss indicators. Um, just this is a long labored list, but the most common ones we see are the NICU um, presence for more than five days, the hyperbilirubinemia, low birth weight. Some of our neonatal colleagues are getting very good at keeping very small, very young uh, premature babies alive, which create greater challenges for us in clinical medicine. Um, from a communication standpoint, from hearing loss, from speech issues, from various developmental delays. And so, um, you know, it's always helpful for those kids that come see us if they've been in the neonatal ICU to get that discharge summary so we can have on there what their hearing screen showed, what their ABR showed, wh whether they were on IV antibiotics during their NICU experience. All those things are really helpful. and. Um, so it's, that's one of those things that maybe electronic health records will, will be good for all of us that we can, when we see these kids, we can just pull that information up. Be nice if we could all get on the same software platform at some point in time, but uh, uh, anyway. The other thing to remember with high risk categories is, is that it fails to identify more than 50% of children with hearing loss. So that's why we can't just use high risk categories. This is what we tried to use for years to capture children with hearing loss. This is what ultimately led to universal newborn hearing screening because we were missing about half of the children that had hearing loss with the high risk um, factors that were being used to try to capture them historically. As the children get older, I will tell you the most important thing is to listen to the parents. The parents will tell you. They know when something's wrong with their child. So don't ever overlook the parents. Don't think it's a crazy mom or a crazy dad. It, once they tell you, I think my child has some problem with their hearing, they're not communicating well, they're not developing like my other child did, then it all of a sudden has become your burden to make sure that child doesn't have a hearing loss. So accept that challenge and make sure that you identify um, these children that, um, you know, five to nine of which develop hearing loss after birth. Uh, so. Uh, ear infections and middle ear effusions can be mitigating factors and it's very easy for us to say, well, your hearing loss is probably just eustachian tube or middle ear related. Um, so if we think that middle ear is playing a role in this and they've got some sort of mixed loss, we need to get that middle ear issue out of the way. You need Dr. Abacus or these guys up here to get tubes in or to aggressively treat that middle ear situation and uh, then quickly get to identifying whether there's an underlying sensory or neural hearing loss present so that that child can be um, taken well, care of, well taken care of, rather. Multiple studies have shown that um, you can't just look at child behavior, though. You know, you can't just, uh, all the parents that come in saying, my child has selective hearing, or, um, you know, it, so always listen to your parents, but also realize there's an objective follow-up that has to occur there that we've got to quantify and identify those children with hearing loss. We got to prove or disprove it. So what do we use for a hearing loss workup? Well, you can go to the literature and find a number of things. Everything from very um, baseline uh, workup from an MRI with Connection 26 being the only two things that some would suggest to others that's a 
order everything that's ever been shown to cause hearing loss. And I think that everybody that practices has to determine their comfort zone when it comes to what you're going to include in your hearing loss evaluation. Um, certainly a good history and physical examination is always important. The hearing evaluation, you need to have an audiologist that you work with that you're comfortable that's going to give you accurate information. You got to know um, they've got to be skilled at uh, ABR testing. They've got to know how to troubleshoot when things are out of the norm and that's why it's, it's great that y'all have the program up here that's going to be um, uh, putting those people out that can do that sort of testing because ultimately in otolaryngology we're at the mercy of the information we're given and so we've got to work together to make sure that that hearing evaluation is accurate and then we're making good decisions based on that information. CT scan uh, the temporal bones um, we often get, especially from a surgical standpoint, because the bony detail is much better with a CT scan than an MRI. The MRI shows you soft tissue detail much better. The MRI is important to make sure that it's ordered with focus on the internal auditory canals. Um, so an MRI with IAC views with and without uh, contrast in, in an MRI case with gadolinium, whereas the CT scan is a non-contrasted study. And then various labs, lab assessments, we've talked about Connexin 26 and torch titers, syphilis, um, hypothyroidism can be a cause of reversible hearing loss. So if you have a child that has hypothyroidism, actually correcting their thyroid hormone deficit can actually cause their hearing to come back up. Um, we don't see lots of autoimmune or um, uh, inner, autoimmune inner ear disease, it's A A I E D. Um, in children, but it can occur um, in older kids and adolescents. And so there's an antibody that can show um, if, you, if your body basically is reacting to your inner ear and potentially causing a hearing loss from an autoimmune effect. Uh, urinalysis to look for all port syndrome. Um, so how do we measure hearing loss? The audiologist, this is what they do, so this is um, um, old old hat for them, but for those of you in pediatrics, the most important thing I want to impress upon you from a diagnostic standpoint is audiometry can be done as early as six months of age. You don't have to default immediately to a sedated ABR for every child that has hearing loss. Okay, So um, if a child's older than six months, you should be able to determine at least if one ear is what the hearing status is. Obviously when you're young you can't get them to wear um, ear inserts or headphones, but you can present the sound to both ears and with an accomplished audiologist doing what's called visual reinforcement audiometry, they can uh, elicit what that child's level of hearing is from a behavioral perspective. OAEs give us the opportunity to test for cochlear emissions. Otoacoustic emissions um, are from outer hair cell uh, functioning and so we can pick those up and identify whether there is a cochlear dysfunction or with the ABR, with ABR in concert with the OAEs to determine whether it's sensory or neural, um, as we talked about earlier. And then the ABR is going to be the definitive evaluation for most of these children. Ultimately, we're not going to make any major decisions, uh, specifically not a cochlear implant decision without having an ABR. Um, but the ABR can be done in those first six months and many times with sleep-deprived techniques without sedation. So if you bring them in, have them skip a nap, don't feed them, and then you bring them in and, and, and have them nursed or fed right before you do the study. Many times you can get an ABR without doing sedation. So an audiogram that you get reported other than just having uh, somebody tell you what it shows, um, there are various forms or severities of hearing loss and this just shows that 0 to 25 or 0 to 20 depending on the practitioner is considered normal. And then you have mild, moderate, moderately severe, and then down in that 70 plus categories where you would enter, where you would consider somebody essentially deaf. And the severe to profound category is the category that we look at for um, considering cochlear implantation. Less than six months, you, um, newborn hearing screen is typically done with an automated ABR. Uh, ALGO is another uh, type. It's just basically the same thing, but it's a different um, brand, if you will. Uh, OAEs are used by some uh, hospitals as their newborn hearing screening modality and then what we just discussed as far as sleep deprived and sedated. Six to nine months, or once they're older than six to nine months, we can do VRA. Once they're older than three or four years, you can do um, 
condition play audiometry. And then temp tympanometry becomes important um, once they're over six months because you can look at middle ear functioning. And for those of you that are in pediatrics, use your tympanometer. Okay, it's a great complement, especially in your younger years of training, to help you see whether that middle ear effusion is present. You can use your insufflator bulb on your otoscope, um, and that's helpful, but you've got an objective measure with a tympanometer in your office. If you've got a reliable tympanometer, you can look at an ear, you can see what the tympanometry shows, and it will really help you. Um, so I encourage you to, to, to use that. I, in my experience, pediatricians just don't use their temp tympanometers very much, maybe because for us, we've got audiologists in the office many times, and so they're doing testing. But if you can learn to use that tympanometer, it can be a real asset to you in your practice. Who should we consult? Well, we've already talked about audiology, but with Connexin 26 and many other genetic causes of hearing loss with syndromic children and such, having a geneticist involved in our implant program is really important. Pediatric ophthalmologist is very important with um, Usher syndrome and other types of um, deaf-blind related syndromes. Um, pediatric cardiology, many times these um, children have uh, cardiac abnormalities, you think head, heart, hand, when you think syndromic children who have hearing loss, and so having a cardiologist involved. And then for me, um, having the pediatric psychologist or developmental specialist is an extremely important part of uh, assessing these children. Because if we're looking to implant by 12 months of age, it's really difficult to identify children who have significant developmental delays that are not verbal, who, and, and so if you have somebody that can do cognitive testing and developmental assessments on young children, it's really an asset to you. I don't know who does that up here in the Tri-Cities area. We use a guy named Bill Allen who comes up, I think, to the Morristown Talbot area. Bill is awesome. I don't know how many of y'all know him, but he has been, since we started our program 14, 15 years ago, um, I've sent all of our patients that have hearing loss to him, and so he's used it. Part, part of it is growing and grooming that person that works with you, because it takes, uh, it takes experience to be able to evaluate those kids and determine if there are developmental problems. Historically, um, back in the oh, mid to late 90s, um, most academic uh, otologists were not implanting children with significant developmental delays. And when I first came to practice, I had a similar type of approach. You know, you just kind of do what you learn. And I think the reason for that was, um, Bruce, did they, did they try to stay away from, from children with developmental delays at Iowa? I remember one uh, Gantz patient that the parent, she was six years old, she's all curled up, and she was the only one that was able to stay away from Right. Right. And, and the reason I think, that there, there was some reason for that because as you know we battle with insurance in many circumstances to get things approved. And I think the academic otologist to their credit realized if we do a bunch of children that are developmentally delayed and we show that these cochlear implants are marginally successful, you're going to have people refuse to allow them because they're going to say it's experimental, it's not proven, it doesn't work as well. But what's transpired is we've proven through the 90s that this technology works very well and now that it's accepted and people don't challenge us, um, then we can open the technology up to more patients and those patients that are developmentally delayed. And the parents have great arguments. They say, well, wouldn't my multiple developmentally delayed child be less developmentally delayed if they could hear? And, and the intuitive answer to that is, well, yes. You know, if a child has multiple disabilities and you can correct the deafness that they have, give them access to sound, without question they're going to do somewhat better. How much better we don't know. But the most important thing about having a developmental specialist or pediatric psychologist involved is that they can help you prepare a parent to have appropriate expectations. Okay? The parent that gets implanted at 12 months of age and thinks, oh, my child's going to kindergarten with all the other kids when they didn't realize there was some developmental problem besides the deafness they really need to know that as early as they can so they can have appropriate expectations because as you know, when you, if you're in the pediatric world, expectations of parents have a lot to play in with how satisfied and pleased and how good your relationship with them is. So treatment of sensory neural hearing loss. Um, hearing aids obviously are an important part uh, of treating hearing loss. 
Um, we typically will do a trial of hearing aids before considering implantation. Um, and then for the less severe forms of hearing loss, hearing aids are important. Um, you know, there are old timey aids, what most people think of as aids, and you have these parents that are really concerned what the, the social consequences of having a hearing aid or even an implant are going to be for a child. Um, but the implants of late are small and, and, and uh, now with uh, uh, Bluetooth technology and uh, those types of things, it's certainly much more accepted and not quite as much stigma as it once used to be. Certainly medication, if, if you have a mixed loss with some conductive hearing loss, trying to clear that middle ear fluid. Um, sign language, I think that uh, one of the things when I first came back to town, and I think that this has gotten better over the past decade, is um, you know the, the, the deaf community and the deaf culture went through, I say when, I'm using past tense because I think it truly is a past tense sort of thing went through a time where they were, they really felt like cochlear implant surgeons were committing ethnocide. They felt like they were going to destroy the deaf community. Their goal was to destroy the deaf community and that's really not the goal at all. Um, so when I first came back to town, I went to the Tennessee School for the Deaf there in Knoxville. I went to the Center on Deafness at UT and talked to a number of people and I said, listen, I'm not some surgical cowboy in town that's just here to start putting implants in every deaf person that exists in East Tennessee or Knoxville. You know, we want to work and collaborate with you. We want those children that prefer to have sign language, those families that are, are maybe an autosomal dominant hearing loss family, that there's multiple family members who are deaf who prefer sign language. By all means, we'll support them. We'll do whatever we need to. But for those parents that are hearing parents that desire implantation, we'll support them and provide an implant. So I think it's really important that you know your community that you're working in and, um, and make sure parents realize that there is an option to cochlear implantation. It's not the only option for um, allowing these patients to communicate. Um, you have all sorts of unusual situations with cochlear implantation. I've got one family who both parents are deaf. They had a child. The first child was a hearing child. So what did they do? They said, well, we're going to have another child so that the hearing child can have a hearing sibling. Well, guess what the second child was? Deaf. So they go, well, now what are we going to do? You know, we had this child to be a hearing playmate to our first child. So you get into all sorts of unusual social circumstances when you're dealing with patients in the deaf community. And you just have to be um, respectful of that. And, um, you know, I think that there's a slide I'll, I'll show here in a minute that kind of addresses uh, some of that um, more. Baja and Sifono implants are implants for conductive hearing loss or unilateral uh, sing or single sided deafness. And then obviously we've been referring throughout the talk to cochlear implantation and we'll talk some more about that here now. I know this is sort of old hat for audiology and otolaryngologists, but for you pediatricians that, especially some of the younger ones in training, let me just tell you how a cochlear implant works. Conceptually, the cochlear implant, when, when patients are deaf, the cochlea is dysfunctional. But typically the acoustic nerve, the eighth nerve, is still functional. So if you can get sound to the end neurons of the spiral ganglion in the cochlea, then you can allow that patient to hear. So the cochlear implant is designed to do that. So basically, what the cochlear implant has you have a microphone on the outside that picks up sound. Then you have an external processor that's kind of shown behind the ear here, and that's what it's used. It's a BTE or behind the ear processor that does several things. It compresses, filters, shapes. It basically creates, puts that sound into an electrical form that can be, then be transmitted from a transmitter coil that's held by a magnet to an internal receiver. So there's, there's skin and fat and muscle in between the transmitter coil and the internal receiver. It sends that sound into the internal receiver which then after you do the surgery and implant the electrode into the cochlea sends that sound down into the cochlea and then those electrodes directly stimulate the end neurons of the uh, eighth nerve which then allow you access to sound which can then be taken to the brain and utilized. Now when I'm talking right here to y'all I'm just making noise. I'm speaking English, I'm making noise, but we've learned to manipulate noise to communicate with one another. If I were speaking Chinese 
or Spanish, and maybe some of you would understand Spanish, but if I was speaking some other language, we wouldn't be communicating at all right now. Does the sound of a cochlear implant sound like the sound of somebody that did not have an implant? No, it's different. But interestingly, those patients that have heard, that have postlingual deafness, that lose their hearing after they've already developed speech, um, tell us that over time, initially mom's voice sounds like, you know, a robot, Charlie Brown's teacher, uh, sounds very mechanical. Um, but eventually, the plasticity of the brain, in many circumstances, allows mom's voice to return to mom's voice for those people that had hearing before they got their implant. Um, but ultimately, for those children that are prelingually deaf, that are just born deaf, they've never known any sound differently. And they just learn to use the sound that they have access to once they get a cochlear implant. Okay, does that make sense? So, so no matter what language I speak to you, I'm just making noise, and we've learned to manipulate noise to communicate with one another, and they learn to manipulate this noise to use it to access sound and communicate as well. Our candidacy criteria, greater than 12 months, severe to profound bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. Um, sometimes that goes down just a little bit. It may be moderate to profound if they've got some moderate thresholds in the low frequency um, uh, range. Uh, limited benefit from hearing aids. In, in my population, that typically is some sort of parent survey. Basically, the parents saying the hearing aids didn't work over a three to six month period. In older uh, uh, folks, older children, and in adults, there are more objective tests that can define that you have limited benefit from hearing aids, whether it's a HINT test or, or MLNT test or what have you. Uh, no medical or otologic contraindications. Otologic contraindication would be the lack of an eighth nerve, no hearing nerve present. Um, historically, that meant cochlear uh, dysplasia, where the cochlea was, was malformed on the CT scan. You look at it and there was just a common cavity or some other abnormality of the inner ear. Now, they're actually, our implant colleague, our implant manufacturers have made specific implants for implanting patients who have cochlear dysplasia. Um, it just, you're going to have to be honest and set the expectations for the family um, in the right place that they know that it's probably not going to be as effective as if they had a normally shaped cochlea. But basically you're laying the electrodes in there and hoping they're going to fire on some end neurons to allow them to effectively use the implant in some capacity. Um, I really can't think of too many medical contraindications Honestly, I mean, if you had a brittle diabetic who might be more prone to infection, if you had um, somebody with a severe heart problem who can't tolerate the general anesthesia, there are very few situations where we run into a medical contraindication to this surgery. I think that probably that's more of an issue with geriatric patients where you have somebody that's 78 years old, has had two bypasses, and just can't tolerate a three-hour surgery. And I think that's more of an issue from a... Uh, uh, age, popu uh, older population. And then good mo motivation and appropriate expectations. It's really important these parents to partner with you or whoever is taking care of the child to partner with you and make sure that they understand that this is something they've got to be motivated. They can't just, uh, the thing that I do with most of these families, I don't have a light switch in there. I typically walk in the room when I'm talking to them the first time I see them or once we decide we're going to do an implant and I turn the light off and I turn it back on. I said, this is not your implant. So many of them think, they think it's like powering up their iPhone or they think it's like turning on the DVD. You know, they think that when they get that implant, it's going to get turned on and little Johnny's going to start hearing and talking, maybe even singing. And it's just not how it works. When you were born, you didn't come out of the womb talking. It took you a year or two to figure that out how to use sound and how to speak. And so it's really important for them to have appropriate expectations. And if they have developmental delays, even more so. It's going to take even longer for them to figure out how to use this sound that they now have access to. So it's really important that you um, prepare them properly. And if they're post-meningitic, 12 months goes out the window. You just try to get them implanted as soon as you can once you identify that they have a severe to profound hearing loss. I already mentioned this, what's limited benefit? Parent survey, some people use the ESP test for younger children, and then um, various um, sentence testing uh, in uh, older children and adults. 
Why do we implant early? Well, it's because of this. If you don't use it, you lose it to some capacity. The, the neural elements atrophy with time if they're not stimulated. And so when in 98, when I first came back to Knoxville, 24 months was our was FDA approval for cochlear implants. And then it dropped back to 18 months. And then it dropped back to 12 months. And there are some people even doing it earlier than 12 months now. But the reason is, is because without stimulation, the nerve cells degenerate. They don't function as well. And with stimulation, the nurturing influence of being stimulated restore those populations or maintain those populations so they function more effectively. And we know that there are critical periods in development of children that are somewhat irreversible. It's why we'd probably have a hard time learning Chinese right now. In fact, they say that your brain, there are some sounds that you just can't effectively hear in other languages to be able to duplicate. And so when you're young though, your brain plasticity is much better. And so as you're developing communication skills, you go through these critical periods in childhood that are somewhat irreversible. And so getting them hearing earlier, that 136 program that we talked about when they're with newborn hearing screening, um, one month having them screened, three months having them referred, six months having them in early intervention, it's really important. This is the reason why. So those critical periods, you need to really have some sense of urgency when dealing with these children. Doesn't have to, they don't have to see the audiologist or the ENT the next day, but you need to have some urgency in trying to get them worked in and seen so that they um, can uh, move forward as quick as possible. This is what I was mentioning about with dealing with the deaf culture. Back in the time when there was a lot more angst um, among the deaf community about cochlear implantation, um, there was a, a, an article that Tom Balcony wrote in um, the Otolaryngology White Journal. And he had a great quote, and I've just, this is what I've, I've used as my mantra as far as approaching these families, and that is, those of us that work with deaf children should remain advocates of the children. We shouldn't be advocates of a cochlear implant technology, and we shouldn't be advocates of a culture. We should be advocates of that child. And so ultimately in the end, for me, when dealing with children with hearing loss, the best decision maker are the parents. Give them all the information they need, tell them what this technology is all about, tell them what their options are with regard to other total communication, sign language, other things, give them all the information and then step back and let them make a decision. Now some of them, you know, need a little guidance, but um, for the most part, most of these parents are, are, are pretty savvy. I mean, you know, they come in with internet stacks and, you know, they're telling you about um, a lot of different things that they've already researched when they come in. But some are just like, you know, you can tell they're just blown away. They just, you know, so it takes sometimes a few visits to help them assimilate all the information and figure out what am I going to do now that I've found out that my child's deaf. So there's a grieving period that some of them go through. Um, but ultimately, we've got to try to t have an assessment and we have to have kind of antennas for where this family is in the process, what they're ready to handle, and then ultimately get them to the point where you can give them the information that they need in order to make the right decision about their child. Timeline, it's, it's variable. I'll have some parents come in and they're tapping their foot waiting for me to finish talking to them saying, when am I scheduling? You know, and uh, so sometimes I have to slow them down a little bit. And then others, you know, I had one child that's I think four years old and we've been talking since the child was about six or seven months of age and they just, it, it just, their anxiety level is so high they just could not ever get to a decision. I said, I mean, ultimately I had to tell this family, I said, you're making a decision by not making a decision. You know, you are, you are in, in an effort to do so much for your child, you're harming them. If, if you're going to ever do this, do it. I, I don't mind if you don't do it. It's fine. But let's make that decision. Make the decision that you're not going to get an implant because waiting till three or four years of age, you're losing the opportunity to maximize the effect of this technology. Three things have to happen, and that's what I do the light switch thing with them. We've got to good, do a good job on the front end of determining who's a good candidate. Then obviously they have to have a good surgery performed in order to, to um, use the implant. But then this piece is the, probably the most important part of implantation, and that's that they get therapy afterward that's effective um, and consistent. So um, 
having for us, we use UT Child Hearing Services down on campus at UT, and they do a great job. They have lots of students. They're in the floor with them. They, have, they spend lots of time with them, and our kids thrive um, in that environment. There are other places where you may have a speech therapist in-house. I don't know if that's the situation here. I know there's several different therapy centers up here when we have patients that come down and get implanted and come back up. But that therapy piece is what I have to spend the most time talking to parents about before the surgery and then after the surgery because they think it's a power button and they're going to get turned on and yeah Dr. Little I'll go to therapy yeah 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 and then they come in and they come see me 12 months later and they go we don't understand why this thing isn't working you know my child only has it just doesn't seem to be working I said well where are you going to therapy um, we've got uh, it, it, school um, and you go, where are you going to therapy? And they go, uh, well, we just haven't been. Well, that's why your implant's not working. You've got to get therapy. You've got to, you know, multiple times a week, they've got to be in therapy being taught how to hear. It's oral habilitation. It's hearing therapy. And it's not rehabilitation in most of these children. It's habilitation. They've never heard before. So you're not rehabilitating what they had. You're giving them something they've never had. Um, I thought y'all might just want to see an intraoperative photo. Hopefully this doesn't, for some of you that are squeamish, it doesn't bother you. But basically this is the recess well. You've got a little bony overhang that we leave, so when the electro lead goes down through here, this holds it into place. This is the mastoidectomy. This is the front of the mastoidectomy, so if this is the back wall of the ear, this is the back wall of the ear canal, and this is our facial ridge where the, mas the facial nerve comes down through the mastoid. Your incus is up here. And then this is the facial recess opened up, and this is the cocleostomy here. So that's the opening where the electrode goes in. You see, okay, I tell parents it's three holes. It's a hole within a hole within a hole. You drill out the mastoid, and you drill out the facial recess, and then you open the cochlea. And that's where the electrode goes in. So. And there's just a photo of uh, an implant in place that you can see the electrodes going under this little bony overhang. The electrode coils in the, in the uh, mastoid and then goes down into the cochlea. And uh, so there's a little grounding electrode on um, one of the implants and the other implant doesn't require that. Post-op uh, rehabilitation, it's critical as I mentioned. Um, Patient's previous experience with sound affects the focus of therapy, so if they're postlingual, it may affect how they approach their therapy. And the goal is to allow them to be able to grow and learn passively from their environment around them, but it takes active therapy to get them to that point. What do we have to watch out for in, in the postoperative period? Well, infection avoidance, vaccination is critical preoperatively. They give for children less than two, they get Prevnar. For children two to five, they get Prevnar and Pneumovax. And for children over five, they get Pneumovax. So um, MRI is possible, but really difficult. You have to basically do a surgery and take the magnet out of the uh, implant, which exposes the implant to infection. So really, we really try at all costs not to do MRIs on these patients. Uh, cautery, if they have subsequent surgery, bipolar cautery is no problem, but monocolor, monopolar cautery can potentially cause dysfunction of the implant. We're really cautious about that, at least getting the grounding pad so that the arc between positive and negative electrode doesn't go through uh, and around the implant. Magnet issues, making sure the magnet doesn't squeeze the skin too much where you get ulceration of the skin, exposure of the implant and infection and ultimately lose your implant. So we always have the parents watch the magnet site to make sure it doesn't, isn't turning red, isn't squeezing the skin too tight because the, the little kids, they want it tight. They don't want it to fall off when they're playing soccer or basketball or whatever they're doing. So you have to watch that. We rarely get complaints of vertigo, pain or tinnitus. It's very rare. Um, older patients, I think, have more trouble with vertigo with implants um, just because they have proprioceptive problems, they've got visual problems with cataracts and such, and I think that they just have more of an issue. But kids are so, they, even if, they probably have more than we realize, but they compensate so well that we really don't have any complaints of that. The variables that affect how well they do with speech is older age at the onset of deafness, so if they're postlingual, they do better. Shorter duration of deafness, so doing it at 12 months, doing it early, not late and then having an educational and therapy setting and support from the family. 
Post-implantation, closed-set speech recognition is developed in the majority of children within about three years. Open-set speech recognition improves without plateau over a four to five year period. Speech perception post-implantation, 89% of children will develop some intelligible connected speech within four years, and it doesn't plateau. It keeps getting better as time goes on. So CI children with more than two years of use for mainstream at twice the age of children with similar hearing loss without implants. They can be placed most of the time in self-contained classrooms and they receive fewer hours of special education support. Um, Dr. Naparco and, and Howard Francis um, up at Hopkins did a study and they showed economically for those that are in legislative positions or those that are in the insurance industry why this technology works and basically there's a cost savings of between thirty thousand and two hundred thousand dollars per child from kindergarten to twelfth uh, grade if you can get these children hearing better and finally why do we do bilateral implantation well it gets rid of the head shadow effect um, for those of you in pediatrics if you have one ear that's not working and one ear that is, if you've got one implant but not the other, then sound coming from this side of your head, the head becomes a shadow for sound getting to your implant. So it's the head shadow effect. You get improved spatial hearing and localization capabilities, directionality of sound telling whether a car is coming from left to right or right to left, or if you hear an airplane in the sky, you can tell which direction it's going. So there's a safety component to it. And then probably the most important thing is this cocktail party effect, which you don't have many three-year-olds at cocktail parties, but the concept is if they're in the classroom and there's the hum of an air conditioner or they're in the gymnasium and kids are yelling and screaming but the gym teacher is giving you instructions, your ability to um, differentiate that sound from the other sounds around you is much better if you have two ears functioning than if you have one ear functioning. So, and then for those children that have, if your device goes bad or you lose a battery or whatever during the day, if you have two implants, the other one's still working. Um, so you don't have a period where you're saying, I've got to get back to my surgeon, I've got to get this device reimplanted. It doesn't happen very often, but for those children, it's really a huge, you know, if you've got a kid in fourth grade and in September one implant goes bad, well, gosh, it may be November before it's back up and going. Time they get in, get implanted, and get activated again. So to have two implants allows you not to have that deficit for that period of time. There are three different cochlear implant manufacturers. I use Advanced Bionics and Cochlear Corporation. I, I haven't included anything about Med-L, just not because I dislike it. I just, it, being, uh, ours is a sm smaller cochlear implant program. We probably do 20 or 30 implants a year. You go to Hopkins and they're doing 100, maybe 200 implants a year now. So, um, you know, it may offer the opportunity to use multiple different implants. But we've gotten really good support um, from uh, Advanced Bionics and Cochlear Corporation through the years and this just shows um, they have for Advanced Bionics they have 16 electrodes with bipolar modulation they've got the new Neptune waterproof processor and uh, they have this clear voice speech processing strategy that um, allows them to uh, have improved speech understanding and noise uh, enhanced lyrics for music and music in general um, works good in quiet and in noisy environments and adjusts, and adjusts automatically in those environments. And so you can see here with clear voice with it off, you've got a lot of background noise, low, medium, and high. And you see down there on the high where you're seeing um, the inflections of somebody's voice or somebody talking to you with a reduction in the background noise. And so its ability to modulate that is um, good for those patients. The Nucleus Freedom implant is Cochlear's implant. It has 22 electrodes. Um, and I'm intentionally just showing you a little bit of marketing pieces on one or two of these slides. And, and I will tell you what, they've got two microphones instead of one, but the thing, the point, one of the points I wanted to make is um, they've got three settings uh, or the set it and go everyday programming that allows you to the patients to adjust to the environment they're in with their speech processing strategies. This compares all three implants, but the reason I show this is not to highlight cochlear over anybody else. I've taken the bottom, the fine print at the bottom, this is the fine print. And the point I want to make from, I want to make two points from this. One, as a surgeon, and I've shared this with both uh, of the manufacturers, 
it's very frustrating because you can't get head-to-head -head data on the implants because one company will come out with their new speech processing strategy and they're comparing to the old pre speech processing strategy of the other company. And then it takes two or three years to gather that information. By the time you get two or three years done, the other company has their new speech processing strategy and they say, well, we're better than we once were. And so you'll get this back and forth of ours is better, theirs is better, everybody's going to market theirs. I can tell you this, they both work and they both work really well. And I tell parents, don't procrastinate getting an implant because you're so confused about which one should I get. Okay, um, and I will tell you this: it is a real positive for these guys to be competitive with one another. Regardless of your political inclinations, competition has advanced this industry. If if we didn't have the implant, if if there was one implant company since the mid '90s, we wouldn't be anywhere near where we are right now. We wouldn't have waterproof. We wouldn't have um, clear voice. We wouldn't have. Um, all the different things that they're saying is making this better and what our patients are saying is better. So they drive each other and that's a positive. I mean it's not a negative. It's, it's the competition between these companies has made them try to make their product better. Miniaturization, longer battery life, all the things that, that kids want. I mean um, colors on their processor, making them, making them fun. Um, there's just a lot of things that they've done and the competition of these companies is what has allowed that to happen. And so I applaud it. I think it's a good thing and I think it's really advanced the industry and really allowed us to get to where we are so these implants are functioning better for the patients that we all serve. All right, I'm going to stop there. I, I, I'd be happy to talk to anybody about Baja, but Baja is an implant that works for conductive hearing loss and uh, single-sided deafness. Um, that's a picture of a Baja implant in place. Siphono is a new implant that doesn't have an abutment, nothing comes through the skin and uh, my suspicion is competition will lead to that potential option for, for uh, most of these types of implants in the future. Children aren't just little adults, they've got lots of differences that we've addressed. Final conclusions, relative incidence of hearing losses in children and adolescents is high. Newer hearing screening and follow-up are key. There are multiple causes and variable severities of hearing loss and treatment and habilitation is available for all degrees of hearing loss, but the type of treatment, when you do it, how you do it, who's most appropriate and what to expect afterwards um, varies for all these children. So it's like we do with every patient that walks through our door each day. You, 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 you take them as they come and you try to offer advice and counseling that allows them to thrive in the environment that they're in. And with that, I'll stop. Um, there is food. I'd be happy to entertain any questions if anybody has anything that, that uh, is a burning question publicly or if privately afterwards um, you want to grab me. I'm, I'm, I'm here for a little while, so I don't mind hanging out and talking to any of you that might have specific issues. Any questions that anybody has about what we've discussed? I have one. Yeah. Um, are you saying if they ultimately pass both years? But they fail times before, but eventually pass. If they ultimately pass, they've passed. Okay. okay? If both years pass, they're passed. But um, there is no, I often get parents come in and say that it was kind of questionable on one side. There is no questionable. This is, this is pregnant, not pregnant. Okay? It, you, it, you know, it, 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 there's no partial hearing screen result. There's either a refer, which basically means you failed, or there's a pass. And if you pass in both ears, you've passed. Okay? Now, if they're high risk, you may need to follow them up, and they may need that visual reinforcement audiology, that behavioral audiogram at six or nine months. You have a higher level of concern for them or what have you. But if they've passed both ears, they've passed both ears. So yes? that was my follow-up question. If you have a kid that has both ears, but you have, say, a strong family history of hearing loss or mom's deaf in the clinic, you would definitely still retest them at six to nine months. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. Those children that are high risk um, still go into a, a more frequent hearing testing protocol 
than other children that are just getting well child visits. So, yes. Anything else? I know you all have days to go get to, so I know you're, you're, you're busy folks beyond just sitting and listening to talks on Friday morning. But I uh, appreciate you letting me come up. Um, uh, thanks for the patience that you've uh, sent down to us um, from time to time. And uh, if we can ever be of help, uh, let us know. Enjoy the, the bit of breakfast that's back there and have a great weekend.